Hey, it's Eamon. Welcome from home as we do on Mondays. Just introducing you to Raul Lopez and our latest Ask an IP Expert interview, which is all about choosing the right partner for your project and what are all the green flags and the red flags to look out for when partnering with someone who is going to be the person supplying you with the chips for your design. <laughs> Enjoy. Hello and welcome to another Ask an IP Expert interview uh, at the IP Exchange Studios. I'm here with Raul Lopez, who's uh, going to tell us about how to select a vendor when you're starting a project. So uh, Raul, um, before we get into that, do you want to just uh, uh, introduce yourself to our community and say a little bit about uh, your career and um, uh, what makes what's uh, what made you decide to talk about this as a particular project yes Le th thank you for uh, having me in this uh, event and i would like to uh, start sharing at the, pre the beginning my presentation talks about myself cool so yeah, go ahead so i am an electrical engineer and manager and in graduate school i specialized in computer architecture i have more than 30 years of experience in hardware and software from semiconductor design and manufacturing at the transistor level. So, you know, those bunny suits that you see in the- Oh yeah, in, yeah, in the clean rooms. In the lab. Yeah, I, I wore those in the, in the lab of my uh, graduate school, but I actually manufactured transistors that I designed. And through system architecture and media SDKs, most, most recently together with system architecture. And then I also wanted to share a couple of examples of my system architecture work so mm -hmm. that you and your viewers uh, understand a little bit more what I have done before. So this is my most complex uh, system design. This was for a company called RGB Networks. And this is a transcoder board. Transcoder, it means that you give video with a certain compression and then you output video with higher compression and in multiple resolutions as well. So okay. this board has uh, 24 um, video encoders, in this case, video transcoders. And it also has a laptop uh, CPU with an integrated uh, GPU. And uh, this complete design uh, took about probably three to six months at the architecture level, and then about a year and a quarter to get it uh, put into this type of board. Cool. And, and how many uh, different kind of vendors were you, were you using um, sure. for this one? The, the, the most relevant vendors here are Ambarella. There uh -huh. were 24 Ambarella SOCs over here. And each one of those Ambarella SOCs gives you what is called a ladder of uh, video transcoding, which is multiple resolutions that are used when you're doing broadcasting or when you're doing uh, internet streaming. And then Intel over here. It okay. was the first time that Intel was used at this company. And then a few other support chips, some FPGAs, and you can see over here the, the power. And then it was a board that connected to a backplane. And then you have some kind of a networking chip here associated with the background as well. You have some status LEDs, and then you have some basic uh, connectivity in the front. Otherwise, the rest, the back, is just a, a proprietary backplane that RGB okay. Network created. Nice. And um, what year was this? Sure this was in 2012. Okay. And you can see here another view of the board. This is actually two stack boards. And mm -hmm. this whole board is so tight. It's actually uh, the equivalent of a one RU, one rack unit. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do think it looked like racks. <laughs> So th this usually would go vertically on a large rack, 14 uh, rack union rack, but each one of these was equivalent to uh, one RU. 
and I can talk later about specific challenges here, mm -hmm. but the the best to me is always how you collaborate with companies that allow yeah. you to put these boards together. That, how many units of this were you were you um, were you creating? Just to give an idea of the kind of the scale of the project. Um, how many of these were manufactured? Mm. These were hundreds for sure. Okay, cool. So yeah, a pretty big project for and, uh, in, in one into production, and it it was uh, quite expensive. You you can find them right now on on uh, eBay for uh, a lot less than they used to retail, but they they still work, and and, and it was a, an, an amazing effort. Cool. But biggest part of the effort was actually introducing the Intel chip here, because RGB had never used an Intel chip before. And also the conception of putting a laptop chip in a, in a transcoder in a video rack. That, that, was, that was new. They were trying to introduce their chips for, for video uses, but this was the first time that it was used okay. there. So in terms of... Um... I'm sure, I'm sure you'll expand on it later, but it, so was that, were you dealing with Intel directly for that or was that through a third party? Yes, very, very important. I dealt with Intel, in, Intel directly. Okay. I dealt with Umbrella directly, yes. And uh, it is actually the best way to do it because you're going to have occasions where you have uh, distributors that are handling the work for you. Eventually, you want to work directly with the vendors, mm. and the the connection was was awesome. It helped that I had been that, that I had been an employee before, but I did not work directly with anybody that had been my teammate. Okay, so, so you were on the system, but no one knew your name, so to speak. Yes. Okay. I, I had been in the system, but the people that I interacted directly didn't know my name. But mm -hmm. they look at my my background, and they saw that I had been an Intel. I'm sure that that had some weight. And then they saw my my career, my academic background, and all of that motivates vendors to engage. Yeah. Okay. So let me go to something much more recent, and at a very different. Uh, very different system design. Mm. This was two years ago, and it's it's now in the market. This is a, a ring camera, and it is an uh, indoor. There are multiple versions, and it is a much smaller system, but it is also another effort that allow that allowed me to connect with multiple vendors uh, directly as well. And this board has the board inside the boards inside here, the whole system has sold millions of units. Mm -hmm. the, the previous version and this one is ramping up to be about the same. Nice. Well, um, just um, out of curiosity, what, what how Oh no, I think I can see from the other image how around how big this that is. That's kind of like that size, is it? The, this is this is fairly small. Yeah. This is uh, smaller than a cell phone. Okay, cool. And uh, it has one, two, two boards. The original had one board, but it was best to do it in two boards. Oh, so that's a bit of an introduction about what you've worked on. Uh, which yes. is very, very impressive credentials. So how long were you at Intel for then? Uh, All together, two and a half years. Oh, First, half a year as an IP provider, then one year as a contractor, and one year as a full-time employee. Okay. And, and uh, I will talk a little bit about that here. Hmm. So aside from the experience and the uh, the examples that I showed, I founded three companies. One was a systems engineering company that made a, a prosumer product 
that came to market and it was presented at CES uh, 2000. Okay. The, the second company was a company that made hardware IP in Verilog. And that is actually how I initially connected with uh, not only small, but also large tier one companies. And then the last one was a media software company. And I also co-founded one company that does machine learning. Okay. Any questions related to these um, items? So I, I guess one of one of my questions is so um, obviously being a clean uh, 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 clean suit um, lab guy. So is so do you, is your expertise across all of all all facets from um, manufacturing to um, uh, chip design and uh, circuit design? Or is there is it, am I right in thinking that you and software design on on this front? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and all of that is important so that nobody tricks you with what mm. is possible and what is not. So if somebody tells you that it is not possible that a certain chip is a certain size or with certain features, you know that if you have uh, the experience in, in making chips, you know that it's actually manufacturable. Okay. And you actually can find out approximately how much a chip could cost. So then by understanding and asking questions about the technology used in the chip, you understand the capabilities of the chip, the possible power. And then as you dive deeper, you understand what is possible. So, and then on the software side, it is important to understand that you get all the documentation needed to be able to write an SDK on mm -hmm. such chip. And then I'm gonna dive deeper into documentation. Okay, cool. Um, well, that's been a pretty cool introduction. So, um, and it, it sounds like <laughs> in order to find the right partner, something that's very useful to have is a team of with a good knowledge base within the team for, from all those aspects of of the kind of semiconductor design and integration process. Um, cool. Um, yes, and, and connections. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, connections are a good thing to have um, simply for selecting a vendor. All right. So, um, so let's get on to this part of the presentation because this is, I think, the main the main part that we want to spend the time on. So let's start with the number one need to make sure that is the right vendor. So companies that you're considering as a component vendor need to be interested in engaging with large and small companies, including startups. Not every company is going to have the bandwidth to uh, engage with small companies and, and or startups. So you have to understand that some companies specialize, some, some component vendors specialize in large vendors only. And other companies are able to sell to both uh, small and, and large companies. And they can have dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of customers. So it's important when you choose a component to make sure that it's a, a partner that you can count on. So it has to be a lot more than just somebody selling you something. Mm. Do, you, um, um, do you see any correlation between the size of the company and who they'll engage with, or is it really, really on a company to company basis? You, excellent question. Usually it's a function of the uh, the size of the company. Okay. Because a lot of the engagement is a function of how many uh, field application engineers they can engage with customers. Okay. And and I will elaborate a little bit more of, of what can be done okay. related to that. Cool. So, oh yeah, I can see knowledgeable FAEs uh, on point H there. <laughs> yes. So 
then let's dive into what you need. You need uh, not only data sheets, you need application nodes, you need sample drivers, and then I will dive into each one of those further, but I wanted to present uh, all of them. Okay. SDKs and their documentation, sample code for any programmable chip, roadmaps, pricing per mass production volume, knowledgeable FAEs, human or virtual, and then demo boards. So all of those are needed from every component vendor, specifically programmable vendors, and then a subset of these for non-programmable components. Okay. Okay. So let me dive into data sheets. So data sheets ideally should be separated by the target reader. Often I find one single data sheet that targets multiple people and it has sometimes too much, sometimes too little information. So I would prefer if the data sheet would be different for an architect, for a PCB designer, for a layout designer, contract manufacturer, and a software developer. So if one data sheet can have all of that, perfect, but it might be 300, 400, 500 pages. And it is not necessarily the size that is gonna tell you that it has all of this information. You actually have to go through it to mm -hmm. figure out if it has this information. So this is a, a call to component vendors to create different data sheets depending on who the reader is. Okay. When you say architect there, is that the person doing the circuit design rather than the, or is that the chip design? No, it's okay. one level above. Is the person that interacts with the product manager and puts a block diagram together. The initial oh, okay. diagram. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so, so kind of laying out what they want the product to do rather than how it will be done. Yes. Okay. So, so the product manager defines what they want the product to do. The architect puts that concept of a product into a block diagram. Okay. So, so let's say that you wanted to make an automotive camera. An automotive camera has an image sensor, has an SOC that processes the output of the image sensor, and then it has a power supply, and it has a connector and maybe a temperature sensor. So that is what the architect decides as a function of what the product manager tells. And that ends up in a block diagram. Mm -hmm. So the PCB designer takes that block diagram with the chips that the architect chooses, the high level chips the architect uses, <clears throat> and then converts it to a board. Okay. So in the case of, of this board, I was the one who chose the 24 Umbrella chips, the uh, single Intel laptop chip. And that was from my interactions with the product manager who told me, hey, I want a card that has this density of uh, uh, transcoded video streams that has this power consumption. And I wanted to do audio video and also ancillary data. Uh, so from that concept, I said, you need not only the Umbrella chips, but you need an Intel chip as well, a CPU. In the past, the work of the CPU was done by an FPGA, but that unfortunately was not scalable. Okay. So the architect says to be able to have something that is scalable and is not gonna be constrained by hardware, you need a certain hardware performance. Is that scalable from a performance point of view or from a manufacturing point of view? From performance okay. and then manufacturability. Oh, okay. So okay. you see here the, the copper, that is the, uh, the heat sink. I guess. And then this is actually a, a module from a vendor that Intel recommended. And then 
Without that engagement with Intel, we would not have known about this module. Okay. And to be able to decide that you have only much this much space, because this was footprint limited. It has a certain height, it has a certain width and depth, and you have to be able to do so many functions. And this doubled the uh, density of the previous product. So to be able to do that, you needed to have higher integration. And that's what the architect does. Okay. The, the PCB designer took my block diagram and connected each and every pin of each and every chip, designed the uh, power supply, and then passed it to the layout engineer who put it in a certain look, put everything in a certain location to be able okay. to work optimally with uh, airflow, like the airflow flowed from bottom to top and that's why you have you see here the um, the fins oriented in a certain direction so you have all of these roles if you're in a in a larger company you will have different people doing it if you have a smaller company you might have one or more of these uh, people and then some of those are going to be in the um, contract manufacturer, for example. Mm -hmm. So the data sheets should contain information relevant to each one of them. So for example, the contract manufacturer, if they are not developing software, they should not care about every register and every bit in every register. Yeah. Neither does the layout designer. But the PCB designer and the architect need to know at least how the GPIO is used. How do you select MOCs for certain connectivity? Okay. Then let's make sure that the data is accurate and updated frequently. And it's important that the values and illustrations are correct. And I usually prefer a new data sheet version than just a uh, errata document. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any questions on? No, that? no, no. I think that's 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 quite clear. Um, do you think so? You you would prefer separate data sheets for each of those roles rather than one really thick data sheet that kind of covers them all? Yes. Okay. Sometimes the uh, certain information is split between data sheets and application notes. Mm -hmm. and then I'll talk a little bit about application notes. Okay. They need to be clear and proven per use case, because sometimes an, an SOC or MCU or component has multiple use cases. And the application node tells you how to use it in one case or another. Ideally, it is your same case, your same use case, but in some cases it's, it's different. So the, uh, the same SOC could be used in a home security camera or it could be used in a, in a media hub. So it is important that you get the correct application node for your use. And in terms of what should be contained within an application note, would that be kind of effectively an example of how this is built and coding and stuff like that? Is that what you'd? Yes, it should include uh, the, uh, the schematic actually. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, a proper, so, so yeah. vendors typically share the schematic of a, of a demo board, and the application node has the block diagram for sure of how every chip around the chip that you're using is connected, whether you use the standards or, or not. And then it describes everything that is needed to make it work. Okay then you need to get for programmable chips sample drivers the sample drivers show you how to use a component in many typical uses i used to get for example and i still do get sample drivers for image sensors so the drivers include every register right and every bit written that shows how to use it for a specific use 
And it's usually written in C because it's, it's portable across many implementations. And each line needs to be documented. Okay. Then the next thing is SDKs are their documentation, the software development kits. Again, this is relevant for programmable chips. And there might be more than one SDK. And you might be surprised that there might be more than one. What I have found is that there are high level SDKs. The high level SDKs do not require accessing the hardware regis register directly. And the low level accesses the high hardware levels, the, the hardware registers directly. So the difference here is what is the experience of your software team? Okay. Can your software team just handle high level APIs or can it handle creating their own layers of software above the metal? Mm -hmm. So the documentation needs to be there for all, all APIs, all their input uh, parameters, and their return results or actions and types, types of everything needs to be clear. There needs to be also support for C++ user code. Some users would want a C++ in an embedded application. And also for large SOCs, usually more than uh, one DMIPS, you would want Linux support. Okay. So it, um, so far we've seen you've explained quite a lot of things where you where you think that they would be something you'd want to see from a vendor. Are there any uh, red flags that people should watch out for in terms of if you don't see this one, then this probably is not something you should work with. Perfect. Perfect. Let me continue a couple more and okay, then that's cool. I'll come back to that question. So, and I was going to ask like, regarding it, you might be about to mention it in sampling code, but stuff like GitHubs, yeah, are those, um, I, I assume that they're, they're a useful resource uh, yes. for, yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah, so right here. So sample code. So the vendors should provide sample code and they should show how to use the high level and the low level SDKs. So they should, for example, let's say that you want to capture video. And to capture video, you need to call certain APIs and it can be just high level APIs. And this sample code is written in C and each line is documented. So it's not the source code of the SDK. It is just an example written in C that shows how to call those APIs. And then if you, and those are usually available through GitHub, yeah. or sometimes they can be uh, drops that people give you in person. Uh, in some rare cases, it is sent through email, but you need some sample code. Then the next thing to go over is uh, roadmaps. You need to know what is the, um, not only the life cycle of your product, of your component that you're choosing, which will affect the life cycle of your product. Yes. But needs to include what they have today, current and next year at least, maybe even two years ahead. Then graphics and text showing the features relevant to choosing a component. So what I usually see is you have uh, columns that represent quarters and then larger dividers that are years. So you have per quarter, you have an, uh, you're going to appear, certain chip is going to appear, and then you're going to have another chip appear later. And they're going to have a certain difference in performance. So in general, if you don't see all of this information from a vendor, be aware that you can ask for it. Okay. They may, be, they may be hesitant to share it, but this is truly what is needed to be able to design a product for a certain 
lifetime and to be able to build the trust that you can use this vendor over and over again. I guess this is the point where NDAs start being signed. The what, sorry? Uh, Non-disclosure agreements start to get signed at this kind of point. Yes, yes, okay. yes, exactly. So, uh, and I'll, I'll also come back to the, uh, to the NDAs. Then you need to get pricing per mass production volume. It can be 1K or less, it can be 10K, 100K, et cetera. But it's very important that the customer is realistic in the request. So it would not make sense, for example, that I have asked for pricing for certain chips in the, uh, in the large board for a million. It would be fantastic if there were to be a million of these gigantic mm -hmm. boards out there, but it is, they're very expensive. So it is not likely that this complete board you're gonna have you're gonna make millions of those. Yeah. But this for certain this camera, it disappeared. You definitely have the. Uh, sorry, let me get back there. You definitely are gonna have millions of these. Mm. Yeah. So. Obviously, the volume is associated with price. So to be able to, to meet a certain price that you get from product management, you need to choose the right component. You need to make sure that the component has the correct uh, configuration that is not over-designed. Mm -hmm. But very important, you get the pricing, but you need to be realistic in the request. The next is very critical to have knowledgeable FAEs that are gonna help you. Ideally, the data sheet is so clear, so perfect, and all the uh, application notes are so clear and perfect, that you don't need to work with FAEs. But when you do, it is important that you're able to connect with them. And those FAEs can be human, or they can be virtual, or they can be a, a mix of them. When, when you say human and virtual, is that in person or and online or what? What's a virtual? Um, no, virtual. It is, uh, for example, a chatbot. Oh, okay. Knowledgeable enough to be able to answer questions that other customers have asked. Do you find those to be particularly useful at this stage, or are they are they still pretty useful? So, so typically you have uh, an FAQ, frequently okay. asked a questions list. Then beyond the FAQ, there is a chatbot. And then if none of them can answer, or if you rather not interact with the uh, chatbot, there is a, a person that mm -hmm. can work with you. But this is where smaller companies will not have as many FAEs. And even if they outsource FAEs, there is a certain cost associated with that. Yeah. So larger companies are able to have more FAEs, are able to have more advanced processes to uh, collect the information and to update the FAQ, for example, or to make, make the chatbot more capable to be able to answer questions. Okay. Cool. And I guess and the longer a product has been out, then the better the virtual chatbot will probably be. Yes, and or, and or the documentation, the mm -hmm. data sheet and the uh, application notes. Okay. And then finally, demo boards. They have- That's to what IP Exchange is all about. <laughs> yes, and, and I will explain why and how. Mm -hmm. And then this is also very, very important that those demo boards have solid mm -hmm. performance. Each board has to perform the same way. They have to be designed such that you don't get different performance from different boards. And I know there are going to be little variations, but each, I have seen examples where the board just doesn't work. You get the demo board, doesn't work. So I always ask for more, more than one okay. because I know that sometimes one is going to uh, not work correctly. Yeah. And I usually ask for three because if one doesn't work, one works a different way, 
I hope that the third one will be able to agree with one of them. Yeah. And I can go to their information about it. And if so, not, I have a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go to the red flags. Okay. So let's talk specifically about programmable components. Okay. So this starts with the interest. And the interest in engaging with a company actually starts with either a personal connection or what the company is sharing on their website. Yes, it's 2023 and websites are still relevant. So it is important that you put out there what you want to do, why you're different. And so when you engage with a component vendor, the component vendor can go to your website and find out who you are. Because unless they know you personally from a previous engagement, you're not going to be interesting unless you show them something to catch their mm. interest. OK. So if you contact a certain component vendor, but don't they, they don't get back to you probably within a week, that starts being uh, concerning. OK. If you contact them and they don't contact you in a month, they're probably not interested in you. So in some cases, small companies are encouraged to work with uh, distributors. That, that could work as well. And then the distributor, if the distributor sees something interesting, they might involve the actual component vendor directly. OK. And then the next is access to all of these. So you obviously start with the data sheets, and usually you sign an NDA as soon as you get a data sheet that is not on the website accessible for okay, anyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've, so we've definitely had that some, before. Sometimes you have product briefs that are two pages. Sometimes you have distributor data sheets, which are maybe 10 pages. But then when you sign the NDA, you get 100 pages or more. And it, it is very important that you present yourself as somebody that is trustworthy. Because, and that's part of the overall message, an NDA is needed in business, but the people are the ones who make those NDAs valuable and be what they are. So, you need to be respectful of what the NDA says. The NDA may even say, you cannot disclose that this NDA exists. So, okay. so read it carefully and follow it carefully and honor it. It is in everybody's best interest. So if it says, do not dis disclose that this NDA exists, you cannot say, I'm engaged with this component vendor. Mm. Wait, say, say that again? Yes. So. You have to be careful that the NDA might say that you cannot reveal that you're engaged with this component vendor, that this ND, the existence of this NDA. So, it's kind is, of like, so would you say that's a red flag? Uh, no, no, no. It's not a okay. red flag. OK. It, it, it is what you see in the movies, and it's actually real. You okay. cannot disclose that this NDA exists. You cannot disclose that this conversation happened. Some companies are like that. Okay. And, and you need to respect that. It's not necessarily a red flag. Okay. You just have to be careful and instruct your team members to be careful yeah. with information. Cool, good to know. Yes. And then you have the application notes. It needs to be clear. If there are no application notes for what you requested, that is another red flag. Then at some point, you're going to need sample drivers. Sometimes those are actually checked in to the uh, Linux uh, kernel. So you don't have to worry about getting those drivers. They already exist. But sometimes you need something, something special. And if they give you a driver that is not documented, that is another red flag. OK. Do, would you say that probably means it's just not well tested? 
or not well tested and not not showing enough care okay because as a component vendor you have to care that the people that are designing your designing in your components learn how to use it and learn its value and it's not going to get back to you with a question that they could have answered in there yeah okay so it works in the best interest for both each time that you document something it is one less question that somebody's going to ask your fae then is the case and this is a, this is a, a tricky one there might exist a low level sdk that talks to the hardware registers and some companies are very serious about the confidentiality of their the registers their capabilities and you have to respect that you might be able to never get the uh, documentation of the registers and the bits but sometimes you do and um, when you do you are able to closely work with the vendor even if the vendor has a problem in their own drivers so getting only high level is not a red flag but if you become aware that there is a low level and they make those accessible that is a green flag okay that's good cool and then make sure the documentation is clear it's up to date so Docu all, docu all documents usually have uh, dates and uh, you just have to make sure that you get the latest version, the latest date with the latest information. And then if they don't give you sample code, that is also a, a red flag for anything programmable because okay. they assume that you know how to call the API and different engineers have different uh, experience levels so they might feel uncomfortable just writing source code user code to call apis without having examples and then again those examples you each line should be documented to make sure that it is understood and then not getting a roadmap is not necessarily a, a red flag but it is not showing enough trust in you as a mm -hmm. client okay. and again this is very confidential like pretty much everything else that they don't share publicly but it needs to be honored so if you're working or aiming to work with a company which has got a new technology uh, which is quite often the case with ip exchange um is there anything that's worth watching out for in terms of whether the um, whether well for one thing whether the uh, chip is in silicon yet or um, if there's a chip that say hasn't entered mass production yet is are those red flags yes. or okay yes so it is very important that if there is a new chip and they want you to use a new chip the the vendor that you become aware when you can get samples okay. how early you could get samples and if the samples are going to be identical to the mp okay and then when the mp can happen when your 10k 100k 1 million 10 million etc can happen so for a for a 1 million product you need to make 3000 a day approximately so your supply chain needs to be capable enough to supply those your vendor has to be able to supply those sometimes you need to buy in advance all of that flexibility is important to have mm -hmm. and then if you don't get access to faes that is definitely a, a red flag again it can be faqs um, chatbots and eventually uh, faes and the experience of FAEs varies a lot between component vendors. So it is important that ideally you get a, a strong person, but you cannot, you don't always have access to the same level of experience. And component vendors have multiple teams. Sometimes they're bringing up a new FAE team and they're going to have less experience. Sometimes the new customers get that 
team that is not as experienced as FAE. So the two of them work together to figure out the information. And then do not be afraid to escalate, to request to the salesperson that you are not getting the information that you need. Okay. And ideally, a good would a good FA help you help make sure that you can integrate the product as well? Would you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, let me stop sharing and then we can switch to your dialogue for Q and A. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, I did notice it says dev boards free. So what's your what's your take on stance on that? <laughs> yes. So the cost of uh, a demo board is usually pretty low. When you make, for example, a demo board for an image sensor, the uh, the run might cost five to twenty thousand dollars, depending where you make it, and you make say uh, twenty or thirty or forty. So that is a small portion of your volume if you are making, for example, a camera that is going to send sell a million units a year. So obviously, if you're making a very small deployment, there is still value in having free demo boards in that the engineers that get access to those boards are able to get familiar with that component. And the incumbent doesn't always win, but often wins. Mm. So when you are when you have learned to use a component, you get comfortable with that component and you want to use it again. If you have a good experience with a vendor, likewise, you have the, the desire to use that vendor again. So cool. I think there is a lot of foresight in companies that make those demo boards for free. Okay. Yeah, that's what a uh, guy has been saying since since we, he started IP Exchange, so it's great to hear it from 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 an IP expert. So that's very very good, and hilariously, you're literally an expert in IP as well. So the pun works. Um, Thank you. Cool. Um, cool. Is, was there any more that you wanted to add? I think this has been a fantastic discussion, and I have learned so much. So I hope the the our community can learn something from it. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, nothing else that I would like to add. And I just make myself available to interact with uh, um, startups. Like right now, I'm also advising startups. I have, nice. I have a full-time full job, but I do like to connect with people and build relationships with uh, component vendors, with enthusiasts as well. Excellent. Cool. I guess I do have one more question, which is, um, so you you mentioned how demo boards can kind of breed familiarity with technology and with the vendors. Uh, would you say that uh, a familiarity with the technology is a good thing when you're trying to choose a vendor? I'm not sure how how similar different technologies end up being, but so. There are chips that are more difficult to program than others. Mm. So, and then you have different packages, different different vendors have different packages. So, if you have a certain constraints, which you you always do, associated with size or price, that familiarity really helps at the architecture level to choose mm. the the right component. And the experience with the board, if it was easy to use, easy to set up. If it always worked, also gives you confidence that the application node is going to be correct, that the sample schematic is going to be correct. So it, it is very important. So a bad board, a bad experience with the board is going to make you doubt, or you should make yeah. you doubt to use that vendor again. Okay, cool. Uh, well, I think that has been a fantastic uh, discussion, and thank you so much for your time and for. Uh, putting that uh, putting that all together, and um, we'll have a, a download link to that document on the on the IP Exchange website, so people can review it for themselves. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much, Raúl. It's been a pleasure, and um, 
yes i, I hope you enjoyed the the other content that we write and um stay yes, engaged with ip exchange yeah thank you well cool, thank you very much okay well if you didn't learn something from that chat then you clearly don't need us <laughs> no i'm joking that's a very eye-opening chat with raul and i especially absolutely love his um his stance on free evaluation boards and evaluation boards in general i mean to the layman you might not think you might, well, you might think one evaluation board is enough, which is clearly quite a naive take. You could, you could get an evaluation board that shows a component that is completely inconsistent with other the com other components. By that manufacturer, it could be just a fluke that it works or a fluke that it's bad. So, yeah, the three evaluation board kind of triangulation thing is a uh, is very good. I'm not sure how many manufacturers will be happy to do that, but the ones who will. It's definitely someone to partner with and um, that's the whole, whole point of this interview anyway i hope you enjoyed that go to the ip exchange website where you can look at lots and lots of boards i'm afraid we don't know if all of those manufacturers will abide by raul's new 10 commandments that we'll be using for ip exchange but there's plenty of great stuff there so keep designing and enjoying our content